Good morning, everybody. So despite all of the efficiencies of the Zoom technology, it still has the effect of people having to file in slowly. So we'll give it just a second here to let everybody filter in. But welcome if you're here for the Kentucky Horticulture Outlook from our AEC Ag Economics team, you're in the right place. Uh, and we'll again, let people kind of filter in from the, the waiting room there. Let's see here. So <clears throat> the reason why we're doing this um, is because our team here, and we'll all get the chance to introduce ourselves briefly in a moment, uh, has participated in this broad uh, economic subject matter training uh, that we do through our ag economics department. And it is pretty big, broad strokes about the outlook uh, uh, for the ag economic picture. It uh, includes commodities, it includes livestock, grain crops, all that kind of stuff. And we usually have a 25, 30 minute session to be able to talk a little bit about horticulture to a general audience of agents. But we thought it might be useful for us to do a little bit more refined version of this or a little more, maybe even expansive version of that discussion with you all who are out here interested in different angles on the horticulture side of things and extension and also maybe most importantly at the end we're really hoping to engage you in a little bit of discussion whether that be unmuting yourself and talking to us through the through the microphone or in the chat or in some other in some other way but we do have a little bit of a program here of presentations I, many of you know me I'm Brett Wolf uh, we're going to hear today from Tim Woods, Camille Dant, and Savannah Columbia. This is all we are all working in the ag econ side of things in one way or another related to horticulture. And so we do have a little bit of a program. You're going to hear from each of us. And then at the end, uh, I get to be the, the person to try to twist your arm into sharing some information with us and, and talking uh, about what the heck it is we're doing here in this horticulture extension world. So without too much more preamble. I'll just turn it over to Tim for a little bit of the bigger picture outlook stuff and then we'll filter through our presentations and, and again leave it some chance if you have questions for us or thoughts and I did have a chance to send out some questions ahead of time and hopefully you got a chance to think about those at least on your uh, trip to the coffee pot this morning or, or uh, at some point so <clears throat> and it, without any further ado I'll turn it over to Tim. Perfect thank you Brett and uh, yeah good morning everybody and uh, thank you all for taking a few minutes to hop on and, and join us in this uh, this share out conversation today. Uh, the horticulture situation, you know, what a what a crazy world that is uh, in and around Kentucky. And uh, Brett was generous. We actually I had seven minutes at the Kentucky Farm Bureau to do uh, the Hort Outlook and scrambling to try to get through a really, really complex uh, big picture situation. Uh, and, you know, uh, our agricultural economy generally has been going through a lot of, uh, a lot of growth, a lot of changes, uh, uh, challenges of different kinds. And, and our horticulture sector itself uh, has its own kind of growing uh, challenges. And so even in this little bit of time that I've got this morning, there's no way I'm going to be able to cover uh, everything. This is not really our goal here today to cover uh, everything that there is uh, to say about the outlook space. Uh, but if you see some things where you feel like, I'd like to know a little bit more information about that, or can you send us some more background? There's more to be said about each one of these pieces, and I want to just kind of touch on each one of them uh, a little bit uh, here in turn. So to, to kind of put things up in a big frame for the horticulture industry in Kentucky, what we see is uh, a lot of new growth and a lot of uncertainty. Uh, when I was talking to the Farm Bureau folks uh, around this information, I was saying uh, the big things that are shaping uh, the things in Kentucky horticulture right now for markets and opportunity are California, climate, controlled environment, and just uh, all the uncertainties around uh, uh, just our uh, local products to local markets and the uh, situations relating to inflation, higher uh, input costs, all these things we'll touch on here quickly. 
So a lot of growth, as many of you guys are probably aware and following, particularly the controlled environment systems. We could have a whole separate section discussing about what's going on there. Uh, but related to this, as you'll see, uh, surging imports that are coming into the U.S. that are impacting the perimeter of our markets. And uh, while we continue to see the U.S. general market conditions being especially impacted by the surging imports, the Kentucky markets have been surprisingly somewhat uh, insulated from those to, to a significant extent, uh, continuing to see wholesale and produce auction markets growing. But lots of disruption uh, in the uh, specialty crop space with labor, transport, uh, input costs, fertilizer, uh, pesticides, chemicals, seed, uh, lots and lots of challenges, not just for Kentucky here, but certainly for the for the U.S., uh, but uh, even in spite of that, in the direct market channels that are a really important part of what we have going on in our Kentucky horticulture industry, we saw a lot of growth in 22 and a lot of uh, sort of positive anticipation for 23 with farmers market, CSA, agritourism. Uh, you know, we saw even, even through COVID somewhat surprisingly strong Consumers, home spending on local products, uh, more uh, construction, home improvement, which helped the nursery and garden centers and greenhouse markets. But uh, we're starting to move into a time where that's a little bit uh, uh, shakier right now. The big picture thing that, we, that we're looking back on right now for 22 is we're anticipating record, by the time it's all added up, record horticulture sales for Kentucky uh, here for this past year. And Kentucky's never been a big horticulture market, but it, you'll see there's just long, slow, steady growth uh, that we've seen. We'll come back to that here in a little bit. So a few very big picture uh, snapshot things. Nationally, uh, we see things have kind of flattened off that blue level of production in terms of physical production of, of fresh vegetables. Uh, more and more uh, import uh, product that's coming in. And so what we see is uh, steadily year by year, uh, uh, um, uh, more and more of this import uh, sales activity so that by the end of 21, certainly by the time we're into 22, we are actually a net importer now of uh, fresh vegetables, which is a big deal. Uh, some of the things that are really driving things, and I want to just point to these products very specifically around fresh products, because these are things that have kind of captured the attention of folks in the controlled environment uh, marketing space, tomatoes, leafy greens, uh, and strawberries. And part of the reason you can see why people are drawn to those is we've seen a long, steady increase in per capita consumption Demands increasing, opportunities in these markets, opportunities for segmentation and specialized, uh, higher quality uh, products there, wholesale all the way to the direct marketing space. And so these high value products are a great fit in the controlled environment spaces. But look what's happening in each one of these in terms of also the, the share of imports uh, that are coming from uh, tomatoes, strawberries, and lettuces, and especially in the uh, last oh, five to six years or so, we've seen a big spike in especially tomatoes uh, and leafy greens. These are labor-intensive uh, enterprises and just a lot of product that's coming in from Mexico, and it's going to create, it has created some challenges for our folks that are uh, uh, putting a lot of investment into these particular kinds of uh, crops. Kentucky has a big uh, diversity. It's a, a growing diversity of production systems. Uh, everything from our Amish and Mennonite uh, producers and the produce auctions all the way to the big CEA enterprises. Uh, in any case, a lot of attention has been put into the high tunnel uh, and season extension kinds of production. You can see this little graphic on the left that points to Kentucky Certainly across the U.S. South, and I think there's only one other state in the in the country that has more high tunnels and square footage of high tunnels than Kentucky. 
It's a great fit. Season extension is a really important, I think, in this climate change, climate sensitivity, climate smart space, even more important uh, to be looking at those season extension and risk management opportunities around uh, that. But that's a lot of what's driving uh, uh, our horticulture production systems now. Savannah is going to talk a little bit more about the uh, produce auctions very specifically, but I did want to point out just uh, uh, some things that that uh, have happened with our produce auctions here in the last little bit. Uh, leading up to COVID, uh, we saw the Fairview market, for example, our largest auction by far, uh, uh, actually did quite well uh, compared to its uh, previous year pre-COVID. A lot of local buyers looking for local products uh, in an aggregation center, like what, what our auctions have, uh, fit very well for our on-farm retail markets, restaurants, small independent grocers, uh, and other uh, local regional buyers. Uh, uh, the auction pretty much across the season, spring crops to summer and tomatoes and uh, fall crops especially did really well. And as we even sort of roll forward and as COVID has sort of played out and looking at the last two years of production, we're continuing to see, uh, at least at Fairview, uh, uh, record level sales of production. Savannah's going to talk a little bit more about what's going on with these auctions, but it's kind of a, a bellwether for me to get a sense of what local demand is and what opportunities are for local products. But there's there's obviously activity in a lot of different market channels uh, that we look at as well. In our direct-to-consumer markets, again, we've seen uh, big growth, record numbers of farmers markets, record numbers of CSAs, more on-farm retail agritourism farms than we've ever seen, uh, which is all pointing to not just some of the impacts that COVID has had, but a lot of the ways that people are looking toward marketing horticultural products uh, looking forward. Lots of uh, strong local demand continuing at the restaurant programs and some of these other buyers but even with that strong demand, you can see, I've sort of alluded to it a little bit before, uh, uh, the last 2022, especially, you guys are all surely uh, have seen this in your own uh, spaces, a big spike in uh, input prices. Uh, and it's certainly held, held for those folks that have been involved in the vegetable sector, uh, seed, fertilizer, uh, chemicals of different kinds, pesticides, uh, and, uh, and labor, all of those things took a big spike. And so even though we've got strong demand, we've got uh, uh, a really kind of a cost squeeze on the, on the other side coming from these input costs. So just to kind of wrap up this kind of Kentucky picture here before I toss it over to uh, Camille uh, and welcome some of your other comments on this, you could see this kind of long steady growth that we've seen in the Kentucky produce cash receipts. Uh, as I indicated there, we'll see a record for both vegetables and fruit sales uh, in Kentucky as it's added up for 22. But just a, a couple of comments in the kind of nursery greenhouse space, which is also uh, another sector that has uh, initially, the garden centers particularly, saw a lot of interest and demand. Uh, and we're seeing uh, the uh, Bell Nursery, uh, the formerly the Color Point Greenhouse up in Paris, coming back in with really large scale uh, production systems, a lot of anticipation for really growing the capacity of Kentucky to be a, uh, a big supplier in this area. But we've seen higher inflation, uh, lower uh, national housing starts, and people just it, it, when people are in a, a tight budget situation, it's really those uh, uh, nursery, garden center, bedding plant, flower products that really get squeezed. And we even heard this from the auctions. Uh, uh, but that said, we even uh, uh, see uh, 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 the nursery sector generating a, a big contribution to the overall sales to get to that. Uh, forecasted a little over $180 million. So just uh, then the last slide here, just kind of looking ahead, uh, we're going to have a lot that is going to be going on, that already is going on around the controlled environment, 
vertical production systems that are these kind of container uh, lighted uh, year round leafy green. We've got a uh, a couple of um, pretty significant enterprises that are coming alongside uh, the folks with Gordon Food Service, the people up in uh, Northern Kentucky that are investing in these in a big way, in addition to some of our other large scale, uh, typical greenhouse uh, kinds of systems. Uh, many of you have probably followed the App Harvest group with uh, 160 acres under glass. We're seeing it not just in Kentucky, but really nationally and really trying to watch that trend carefully. But these input costs are important for these uh, kinds of enterprises as well. And especially when it comes to energy, fuel, and things like this. I think as we look forward to 2023, keeping an eye on how inflation and uh, incomes are going to potentially affect things like direct marketing and tourism, uh, they tend to be uh, price sensitive uh, for those kinds of markets uh, there. And uh, uh, I think that's going to be an, an important thing to watch uh, here as we move into this next uh, season is how the economy might affect some of our direct market uh, opportunities. And always looking toward what's going on with these imports and uh, the Mexican market and more and more of this very low cost, uh, low labor cost enterprise uh production being imported uh, there into the United States. So yeah, that's uh, just kind of what's intended to be kind of a quick big picture view. And uh, uh, certainly as you guys have some comments, you wanna drop some things uh, in the chat. Uh, Brett, I guess we can come back and follow uh, afterward as people may have some, yeah. uh, some questions, does that work? That sounds great, yeah. Um, and so while, while Tim is is de sharing and Camille is sharing, uh, I thought I'd go ahead and ask if there was anything that for you all jumped out as either surprising or new information in that what Tim was just talking about. Um, if if there is, I'd drop it in the chat. I'd I'd like to see. I don't know if that was if that was all old news to you all, or if there was anything again that jumped out as particularly interesting and and uh, or shocking perhaps uh, you know we get a little bit excited in the uh, horticulture world so it, maybe it was a bit shocking uh but our next presenter is going to be uh, at least on this call one our newest colleague but has been around and been doing a wonderful job multi-talented uh ag economist and she's going to be sharing with us a little bit about uh, some of the marketing training programs we have available that might be useful to you all uh, I hope she gets to share a little bit about some of the other projects she's working with and, and who she is, because I know that uh, relationships with agents is one of the things that has been most gratifying for me. So hopefully you all can reach out to her and, and we can all work together. But I'll turn it over to you, Camille. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Camille Dant. I, as Brett said, I'm an extension associate here at the university. Um, I came on in 2021, November, so still fairly new. Some of you all may have seen some emails from me. I'd say most maybe have never even seen me before, or heard my name before. Um, I'm from Nelson County originally. I graduated in 2018 with my bachelor's in Aggie Con. Went and kind of did a few th different things before, once I graduated, before coming back to Aggie Con and couldn't be happier being back. So extension has shaped my life growing up. So I'm glad to be back involved in it. So just that's a little bit of background on me and who I am. So nice to meet everyone. Um, I also am working with Tim on our value added dairy uh, marketing market ready portion. So if anyone no, this is horticulture, but if anyone knows of any dairy producers who are interested in any um, forms of value added products, uh, digital marketing, uh, things like that, uh, feel free, send me their email or get in contact with me. Uh, we are hosting a digital marketing training at the end of March, as well as our market ready dairy trainings in May. So we'll send out some information. And if you, again, if you all know of anyone, feel free, send them, send them my way, send them Tim's way. We will, we will get them hooked up with some information they need, but we'll go ahead and get started with just the marketing for all trainings um, that we have going on. So what is Marketing for All? Some of you may know, some of you may not know, but it's um, our beginning farmer-friendly training uh, spanning online, 
social media marketing, best practices for direct market vendors, self-evaluation, and basic market research skills. So these are one-hour trainings that we offer. We have many different ones, original and new um, trainings. So here are new modules, our personal selling skills, customer retention and engagement, digital marketing basics, uh, photography, digital ad tips, and tricks. So those are our new modules that you'll see. You may have not seen those before. And then our original modules, you have marketing basics, social media basics, basics of web design, hands-on visual merchandising, which I believe Brett has done that one fairly often. So I'd say probably some of you have had him come and uh, give that at your extension offices. Uh, we have marketing signs that work, identifying and exploring new markets, understanding and using analytics, record keeping for specialty crops, using price data to make more money, value added product de development, and accepting more than just cash. So those are our original modules. Some of you may have already had us present on those, or we can still present on them as well. And then here is the flyer that you may have seen going around. I know this is on the CCD website, which you can also go and request more information or if you would like for um, some of us to come and present this uh, one evening at your extension office, you can just fill out the, I think it's a little link and it'll say what you're interested in. Or again, you can always just reach out to us directly and we can get you set up on any trainings that you are interested in. And then we are also, as Brett had mentioned, I'm fairly new. So some of you, again, may know me, may not know me, um, but we're also interested in having some farm and market visits. Um, so if you all are going out anytime in the spring or the summer and you think, hey, the CCD team, they would love to come and see this, or I would like to show them this, or get us in contact with any farmers, or um, take us to any markets in your county, we'd love to come and visit and get involved. Um, just to see kind of what else is going on out there uh, within the state. So yes, please feel free, reach out to us. We'd love to come visit anytime. Just let us know. And mine was fairly short. So thank you. This is my contact information. Um, just camille.dant at uky.edu. Uh, feel free again to reach out either with Marketing for All or Value Added Dairy. Again, I know this is horticulture, but dairy theory as well. So thank you all. Brett, I will hand it back over to you. Cool. Thanks. Thanks, Camille. That your your brevity will serve will serve you well in your extension career. Uh producers especially appreciate getting to the to the point. And you certainly did. A couple of things I would just just mention about the the marketing for all program. Um, so that was funded uh generously through the specialty crop block grant program from our partners at KDA and USDA. Uh, back in 2017 and we actually got a lot of positive feedback on it and so we're able to re-up some more funding in 2021 for this next round to add those new modules and a couple other pieces of that and it really does function like a 101 and maybe even like a 102 or 201 it's been a while since i was in college so i don't remember how that works but an entry level to like slightly intermediate marketing programs and we can do those typically in about an hour long uh, per module. And so we've done them at, we have one coming up, uh, a couple of them coming up in like in Shelby County, for instance, we're doing uh, two modules one week, and then two weeks later, we're coming back and doing two more modules. So we're going to cover four out of those 14 over the course of a month uh, with the producers there. And that that's kind of how it was designed to be an a la carte menu, but you can also put it together into combos and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then as far as the the visits out, yeah, I, I would just echo what Camille said. Uh, and and Savannah, if you want to go ahead and get, get your stuff queued up to share your screen, uh, I would just echo what she said. Uh, Savannah let, took the point on organizing us to go out and visit some uh, agritourism, roadside market kind of stuff last year. And it was really great. It's great to see people and um, check out their unique or also similar approaches to marketing in that that world and uh, it's important for us in addition to talking to you all to also see these practices on the ground to stay relevant so that we can update our programming update the photos in our programming and just make sure that we're serving the needs of the of the horticulture community in the way that we would like to and so again i would just echo exactly what camille said if you all have folks who are either interested in some input uh, and some thoughts from, from a marketing-minded group of people, 
or if you have people who are doing something really cool that you're just proud to show off and want them to kind of know that they're doing a good job and we can learn from them. That's another, another angle on that. So I would just, uh, as you can tell, I, I'm a uh, blabber on much more than Camille does. She's uh, better at the, <laughs> to the, to the point than I am, but I just thought I would uh, just echo that and say, thank you very much, Camille and hand it off to Savannah. Thanks, Brett. Um, my name is Savannah Columbia. I am an extension associate uh, like Camille. I've been with the team for almost three years now. Um, and today I'm gonna to talk about our market ready training program and the produce auction. Um, so we will start with the market ready training. Um, Tim has done this training for a long time. I've been working with Tim on it uh, since I've been here. Um, market ready is for producers uh, and agents are um, welcome to attend. Um, that are interested in grocery, retail, restaurant, farm to school, um, wholesale distributor uh, sales. Um, it's kind of our target audience, um, but any any producers are welcome to come. Um, the training is free when it's offered virtually, uh, so there's really no um, expense besides the producer's time. That goes into it, it's about 90 minutes um, on Zoom, um, but you know we welcome all uh, levels of producers, maybe people who are just interested in like finding out, you know, what is it, what would it be like to sell to a grocery store, um, and then producers that are ready to take that step. So we um, we will not record those trainings. We offer them multiple times a year. Um, so we usually just don't record them. Um, we do have our spring dates set. Uh, right now. Um, the two dates for our market ready training are going to be Monday, March 20th, and then Friday, March 24th, both at 1130 um, a.m. Eastern time. They will be the same training, just offered uh, at two different dates so that um, people have a choice of which works best for them. Um, registration can be found on the market ready website, which is linked um, here, uh, it's not live yet, so it's not on the website, but it will be um, this week. And then following our market ready trainings, we have our advanced topics. Um, so this is actually the flyer from last fall, um, but they are 90 minute on Zoom also, uh, deep dives into the topic areas that producers wanted to um, know more about. Uh, these are all pieces of our, our business functions, but the ones that um, producers maybe needed help more with or um, you know just wanted to know more about. Uh, so we developed this advanced topic training to um, help them along. And so they all will feature a, a special guest from the industry. Um, and you can see on the flyer like who they are. Um, for marketing, we have uh, Jonathan Van Balen from the KDA's uh, Kentucky Proud program. Um, Brian Brady and the Food Systems Innovation Center doing quality assurance and like gap uh, questions. Um, Clint Quarles doing risk insurance things. Uh, what Chef Swant and Rockford Packaging doing um, the other two webinars uh, and they are uh, people from the industry. So we have um, usually a short, a short PowerPoint presentation and then we follow that up with um, like live Q&A with our special guest um, to kind of give producers the chance to openly talk to um, people who uh, can provide like really specific information. Um, and you don't have to register for all of them, you know, it's kind of cafeteria style, like pick what you want to attend. Um, but these dates are set. Uh, they will be April 5th through May 3rd, um, which is going to be Wednesdays at 11.30 a.m. Eastern time. Um, the registration will also be on the website under our events page um, going up this week. Uh, we don't have the special guest uh, like pinned down just yet, but April 5th through May 3rd is the time um, and dates that we will use. Just a, a heads up. Um, and then in addition to that, we have uh, some new, a new website. Um, it's updated uh, last fall. Um, the new URL is marketready.uky.edu. Originally it was backwards. It was like uky.marketready.edu, but now it is this way. If you type in the old link, it will redirect you. Um, but we have tons of resources on our website. These are just little clips 
um, screen screen captures from the website. Uh, we have a lot of tools and resources available. Um, so feel free to give it a visit. Um, you know, there's a, a contact us button that you can um, send us an email. Um, and then each of these little uh, pictures like pricing, storage, supply, those are all um, little tiles. And then if you click on them, they will bring like a whole page of, of information and, um, you know, like helpful guides, tools, even like some references to other websites that can give you more detailed information. Um, so we launched that in the fall. So I just like to to give that some, some uh, exposure. And then the last piece of Market Ready um, is our buyer tours that we started last year, uh, which were so awesome. Um, the last year was the first year we did them and we did two buyer tours in August, um, one in Lexington and one in Louisville. You can see on these um, little, little graphics, these are the flyers. Um, so in Louisville, we, I uh, started at the Kentucky Farm Bureau Insurance um, office, and then we did a tour of uh, the Jefferson County Public School Nutrition Service Center, so farm to school. Um, we did a tour of Rainbow Blossom Grocery, and that visit was really cool because some of our producers that were on the tour actually got to see their product on the shelf, um, which was really cool. Uh, and then we did lunch at In Season Harvest Kitchen, who does local sourcing, and then the last stop was What Chefs Want, which is a um, local wholesaler. And then in Lexington on the uh, right side, we did um, a tour of food chain. And this tour is a little out of order, but we did a tour of food chain, um, UK Airmark, which is the university's dining service, um, lunch at an Oedo Michaels restaurant. And then uh, we also visited Good Foods Co-op, um, which is a local food grocery in Lexington. And um, we didn't end up visiting Critchfield Meats uh, because the schedule was a little tight, but um, they could be an option for this year um, because we will have them again. So I think we're going to do two more tours, one in Lexington, one in Louisville for 2023, um, probably in August. Again, I think that time frame worked out well. Um, we had about nine to 10 um, people on each tour, and that included both growers and technical assistance providers. We did have um, some agents um, people from the Kentucky Horticulture Council, from KCARD, also visit. Um, so you all are are welcome to come. Like it was, I felt like everyone really got something out of the out of the tour, whether they were, you know, a grower or a technical assistance provider. Um, so information about these will probably be posted um, in the summer. And with that. Uh, the buyer tour information and our market ready producer training information will all go out on um, the listserv, both the horticulture and the the A and R listservs. Um, so you all will receive that information from me via the listserv. Um, one more plug for this is actually for the Kentucky Horticulture Council, um, but they have an upcoming grower buyer meetup um, as a pre conference event for the. Uh, Eastern Kentucky Farmers Conference that is this Friday. Um, Market Ready will be there with a little booth, uh, but I just wanted to put that plug in for them. There is registration, uh, pre-registration required for this event, and the conference has their own um, event. I have the link, so I can put it in the chat after I stop sharing my screen. Um, and then the moving on to the produce auction. Um, so we will have another three year average prices and quantities report coming out, and that'll be 2020 to 2022. Um, a lot of people use the price auction, the price data um, on the website, which I've linked down here. The price data can be found under the price reports tab on the um, CCD's web page. Uh, but just wanted to put a plug that we will have another version of this um, publication coming out, and this publication uses data from both Fairview and the Lincoln County Produce Auctions. Um, and then uh, with the success of the buyer tours, we've been thinking about doing a produce auction tour. Um, this will be probably in May, um, I think, um, and we'll actually get to, we'll actually plan it for a day of the sale. Um, so producers, technical assistance providers um, can go 
with us and have an opportunity to visit the auction, talk with the manager and um, see how selling at the auction works. We have a lot of producers um, and people that are interested in learning more about the auction, selling at the auction. Um, so we wanted to kind of put this educational opportunity out there um, to, to connect people. Um, so this, I'm not sure what website this will be hosted on, um, but information will come out later um, about this probably in late spring, early summer. Um, and lastly, uh, just to how to connect to these events. Um, my contact information and event information can be found on the Market Ready website and on the Center for Crop Diversification website. Um, my email is in the training reminder that Brett sent out this morning. Um, so reach out if you have any questions. Uh, I'm I'm happy to uh, answer anything. And if I can't answer it, I will forward it to someone who can. Um, and then a side note, uh, in addition to the uh, things that I talked about today, I also work with Cut Flowers, um, Controlled Environment, Agriculture, and um, the Marketing for All program that Camille talked about. Um, so just some other topic areas that I have my hands in. Um, and that is all I have for you today. Great. Thanks, Savannah. I was thinking maybe for the, the produce auction tour, we could have a auctioneer contest to see who who's the best auctioneer. Like, I feel like, I don't know, you and Camille both, I feel like may have a, a gift for, for talking fast and doing a produce auction. Maybe the, the prize can be like a pallet of tomatoes or something. Yeah, uh, we might have on. a leg up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, well, hopefully you all are, uh, the, the agents who are on are, we're already familiar with the, my colleagues here, but I'm just so impressed by the talented group we have. Um, sadly, the talented portion of the program is over, so it'll be just me uh, for this next little bit. But I'm going to share with you a little information about uh, some CCD updates, some fun little data that we've gotten from a tool that we developed. I want to just orient you very briefly, make sure you're aware of all of the uh, stuff we have on the CCD website, and then most importantly, open it up for some conversation with you all uh, about what it is we're doing here in horticulture extension. So let me share my screen. And pop over here. Do, do, do. Does that look right? All right. So I mentioned a little bit about what I'm going to, well, maybe not. Let's see. I'm going to stop real quick. Do that. Oh, page unresponsive. So I, against my better judgment, I tried to use the in-browser uh, PowerPoint rather than having it downloaded to my computer, but uh, this is, I guess, what I get. So while I'm doing that, I'll just go ahead and orient you to the to the website here and make sure you're aware of everything that's, uh, that's available. So on the left hand here, we generally have organized these links according to how heavily they're used. And so many of you all are familiar with the farmer's market and produce auction price reports, but we have those available here. Um, we have them for Kentucky markets. We have them, we, this year we're hoping to have Illinois rejoin the par, pr, price reporting uh, group, but then uh, we have Indiana share, uh, sharing some, Tennessee was sharing some for farmers markets. We also have them for, for produce auctions in a couple of different spots. Uh, the production is just our crop profiles, marketing. We have the marketing profiles in addition to some other tools. Um, a couple of things I just would draw your attention to. So one down here is the budgets. Uh, we have these enterprise budgets, which are relatively rare in nature. Uh, they're, they're hard to come by for the types of crops that we offer them for. And uh, they are scaled down to some degree. This was something we got feedback on was uh, one acre of tomatoes is too much for an enterprise budget for some of our producers. So we actually have these scaled down versions of those uh, available 100 row feet or 10th of an acre, that sort of scale. 
Um, I mean, Savannah and Camille mentioned the Marketing for All program. That's This is where you can find information for that particular program and get, find that flyer and the form that Savannah or that uh, Camille mentioned. I'm going to try to talk to you about the Hort Biz Quiz and share some of the uh, interesting results that we've had from some of our producer responses. And then I'm also going to talk to you about this registering for this uh, farm succession series here. All right, let's see if I can... I'm going to stop sharing here. This is all very, uh, very smooth. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Tim, while I'm working that, do, working on that, do you have any particular thoughts following up after Camille and Savannah about the the produce auction stuff or the yeah uh, the marketing for all program? Yeah, let me just uh, uh, just mention. You know, I think with the with the auction things is, you know, we've talked with a couple of the bigger auctions. We have probably 700 producers across the state that are selling uh, at one of our five, six auctions that we've got around the state. And, uh, you know, as these auctions grow, they're carrying more and more products. Uh, they're open to anybody to sell through them. And, and uh, the auction managers and folks that work there are obviously trying to stir up business and encourage folks to sell products through there. But it seems like it could be really helpful to pull together a handful of uh, producers, do a little kind of an in-service show and tell, just sort of see how it works, how, uh, you know, a grower gets set up with the, with the vendor number. And even though it's anonymous, you can kind of track and see how your products are moving out there and how does payment work? How does, food safety, quality assurance kinds of things work. And uh, it, these auctions are actually fairly impressive and sophisticated uh, marketing aggregation distribution systems that have really evolved and adapted to what buyers are looking for. And, you know, we've just seen prices generally getting better as the auctions are becoming more uh, aware in the buyer community and, uh, yeah, so we're just hoping that we can get an opportunity to have some producers visit with the auction managers and do just kind of a little kind of walkthrough of here's how you engage and here are some of the CCD resources where you can think about, uh, you know, what prices have typically looked like for small fruit or cabbage or peppers or tomatoes of various kinds and, uh, you know, season extension opportunities have opened up, I know, for folks to look at are there premiums early, later? So yeah, I think that's a uh, you know something, and we'd love to you know have your input and see if there are producers that you've got. We'll probably start with uh, uh, maybe reach out to Kelly and see if we can set up something in um, the you know with the Fairview auction out Hopkinsville area, and then try to do another one in the Lincoln County, our two biggest uh, auctions, as a way to do that. But yeah, stay tuned and Savannah. Will, help us pin down some dates and the details on that. Yeah, I think one of the things too that you mentioned the the year over year sales and how they've basically been setting record years back to back. A lot of that come, has come from increased prices. It has been increased volume, but increased prices has been a big part of that story. And I think that makes it something that's maybe a, a possibility for some producers that in the past that when prices were a lot lower, um, they maybe it wasn't much of an option. But I think I got my technology sorted. Thanks for uh, Thanks for that. And uh, my parts here is going to be pretty brief, uh, mainly just making you aware. So as you know, we have a lot of publications available through the CCD. And so I just kind of skimmed a couple that were new this past year that we updated this past year that might be of interest to you all and also to demonstrate the breadth of the things that we talk about. So we go from dry beans to catnip to soil salinity and high tunnels. It's a, a wide swath that we cover and we know that you all cover. We do our best to keep these things updated. Um, there's also been... Uh, these are just examples here. All these are available on that site on the, the production section. You can click there and find it broken down by crop. Uh, Savannah also mentioned the cut flower stuff, and she's written some publications. We've worked with uh, Melanie Stock out of the universe, or Ohio, or Ohio State, Utah State University, and a uh, several number of our agents. That, that core group working on cut flowers is a really strong one, and there's, as you all know, a lot of interest from producers. And so as such, we have some things on our YouTube channel as well that might be of use for you all. 
The top one I have listed here is this Cut Flower short course where they got together some really cool speakers, producers, and marketers in the field of Cut Flowers to speak about some of their practices. Very, very popular resource. If you were at the Fruit and Vegetable Conference, you probably saw the packed out session. Um, and that's usually the type of draw that Savannah brings for any time she talks, but there was a hundred people for the whole, pretty much the whole time there uh, for everybody. So it was really great uh, to see that and see that need being met in such a fun and innovative way. Uh, so these are hour long sessions that are available on the YouTube channel that you can check out and see Farmer Bailey and I don't know, some other people talk about cool stuff. Um, there is a horticulture research farm tour, a South Farm tour, if you're interested in that. I was asked to come and talk and wasn't able to make it out to, to talk to a producer group about the SARE producer and on-farm grants. That's something that I work with. Tim and I both work with the SARE program, Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education, but there's a new YouTube video up there kind of just explaining what that looks like. And we also have some new videos going up now from this farm succession planning thing that I'm just going to cover. I'll talk briefly about just in another second here. Um, so we have this, th this tool that we rolled out. It's designed to help address the question, I just bought 10 acres, what do I do? Or five acres, or what do I do? And so it, it takes them through, they click on this nice, colorful little uh, doodad here. It takes them to a thing. Uh, uh, actually, it's like a survey, but it looks like a tool where they answer questions about how much land, labor, and capital they have. And then it spits out some uh, suggestions and thoughts about, you seems like you have a lot of land and a lot of labor, but not much capital. Here are some things you might think about. Most importantly, it encourages them to reach out to you, their extension agent, and talk through this more. But the idea here is that it's an initial conversation starter. It's a little bit of a screen for people who are or are not really serious, because if they don't take the two minutes that it's gonna take to fill this out, they may not have the uh, uh, the wherewithal to get into the horticulture business. But um, so the cool thing about this is sneakily, it is a survey. And so it's allowed us to collect a little bit of information and forgive me because I know all this will be old information for all of you since you're avid voracious readers of our newsletter. Um, but forgive me if one of the one or two of those slipped through the email cracks and uh, you, you weren't able to find it. But we have pub been publishing these short little articles talking about some of the results of this. And so um, here's an example of one here. So this is asking how much capital do you have to commit to this enterprise? And so these are just the Kentucky responses that we've received. And it's kind of an interesting breakdown here. Um, and for me, there was a larger contingent than I was expecting in that $10,000 and up range. Uh, I was expecting a, a really big chunk of people that didn't have anything to contribute. And so that's, it's just something to think about. It's a little contextual information that we can use and compare this with land, how much land people have, how much capital they have. But I think by and large, people don't tend to have a whole bunch of money to contribute to, to enterprises. And that's something we wanna be aware of in our program. And so this is all just kind of, again, for general interest about some Kentucky specific stuff. This is the one that we all, all of the speakers on this call, our ears perk up, which the question is, do you have a specific market in mind for the product that you're doing? And this might reflect what you all hear. So this Pac-Man here, the green and yellow Pac-Man, that's the sort of, <laughs> probably yes, probably no. I don't know, you know, exactly, maybe, might, might or might not. And so in general, we're trying to encourage folks, and I think this is just a, a message for us to try to continue this, to encourage people to have a market in mind before they get started with what they're growing. Um, this is the what you think about before you plant. This is the primer. This is the having that market in mind and growing for that market. Um, again, this is from an upcoming one, I think, about labor. This is how much labor do you have? So very, very few people have a lot of labor. Uh, and a decent number of them have little or none. This is a bigger, more complicated question than we have time to delve into here. I'm going to want to leave us as much time to talk as we can. But, uh, and then the last one here was land, questions about land. And this fall, this came out, came out about how I was expecting, uh, that about half the people have less than five acres and half of them have more than five acres to commit to a horticultural enterprise as they're thinking about it. This over here on the right just confirms that uh, the rich get richer. If they have more than $5,000 to contribute to their enterprise, they also are more likely to have this larger amount of 
land available to them. And so those are kind of these split different types of ventures that we might be thinking about tailoring programming to. So again, this is just some tidbits that came out of this, but the ultimate goal of the biz quiz is to provide fodder for you to have conversations with growers who are thinking about getting into the horticulture business. And again, you can, uh, you can have your producers take that by going to the CCD site and just clicking on this, take the Hort Biz Quiz. And if you remember just down below that on that homepage where I just showed you a few minutes ago, there was a link that said Farm Succession Professional Development. So this is aimed specifically at you all. And this is this series about how to talk and walk alongside producers as they navigate farm succession and transition from generation to generation, from one owner to another. It's a very complicated or uh, maybe not complicated. No, there's complications to it, but it can be a very messy issue. And so this is led by uh, Dr. Nicole Huff and Dr. Steve Isaacs. Uh, many of you all know Steve from our department. Uh, and this, we're just in the middle of the series. If you don't have to have taken all of them and the first two are now available online as a, a recording, the Ayers property one, I mean, both the first two were really, really strong. Uh, the first one was a present presentation by Dr. Becky Smith out of Mississippi State. The second one from Dick, Dr. Dave Marison out of Ohio State, out of the Ohio State. And he uh, was talking about communication, communication strategies, Very, both very strong speakers giving uh, interesting topics. So um, the, again, I work with the SARE program. I work with the Center for Crop Diversification. And so I, I end up dealing with lots of different groups, but today we're focusing on this horticulture side of things. And we wanted to engage you all a little bit with some conversation about how things are going out there. You know, here we are kind of post, definitely post the bulk of the pandemic, but I don't think we're not even close to post the effects of the pandemic. Uh, things have shifted, but have stayed the same. And so we had just a couple of questions and um, feel free to, any of my co-presenters or if anybody else has comments that don't fit with these that's absolutely fine i'm a bit of a touchy feely about extension and our mission and what we're doing and so the, my first question here was as you think about these last few years this whirlwind of several years savannah said she's been working with us for three years which kind of jarred me and made me realize how much time has actually passed um when when were times or people that you interacted with where you felt like this is extension has, as I understand it, 